Chapter 12, Part 1 of Volume 2 of Airplane Flying Handbook, FAA-H-8083-3A. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Norman Elfer. Airplane Flying Handbook by the FAA. Transition to Multi-Engine Airplanes. Multi-Engine. This chapter is devoted to the factors associated with the operation of small multi-engine airplanes. For the purpose of this handbook, a small multi-engine airplane is a reciprocating or turbopropeller powered airplane with a maximum certificated takeoff weight of 12,500 pounds or less. This discussion assumes a conventional design with two engines, one mounted on each wing. Reciprocating engines are assumed unless otherwise noted. The term light twin, although not formally defined in the regulations, is used herein as a small multi-engine airplane with a maximum certificated takeoff weight of 6,000 pounds or less. There are several unique characteristics of multi-engine airplanes that make them worthy of a separate class rating. Knowledge of these factors and proficient flight skills are a key to safe flight in these airplanes. This chapter deals extensively with the numerous aspects of one engine inoperative, OEI, flight. However, pilots are strongly cautioned not to place undue emphasis on the mastery of OEI flight as the sole key to flying multi-engine airplanes safely. The inoperative engine information that follows is extensive only because this chapter emphasizes the differences between flying multi-engine airplanes as contrasted to single-engine airplanes. The modern, well-equipped multi-engine airplane can be remarkably capable under many circumstances. But, as with single-engine airplanes, it must be flown prudently by a current and competent pilot to achieve the highest possible level of safety. This chapter contains information and guidance on the performance of certain maneuvers and procedures in small multi-engine airplanes for the purposes of flight training and pilot certification testing. The final authority on the operation of a particular make and model airplane, however, is the airplane manufacturer. Both the flight instructor and the student should be aware that if any of the guidance in this handbook conflicts with the airplane manufacturer's recommended procedures and guidance, as contained in the FAA-approved Airplane Flight Manual and or Pilot's Operating Handbook, AFM-POH. It is the airplane manufacturer's guidance and procedures that take precedence. General. The basic difference between operating a multi-engine airplane and a single-engine airplane is the potential problem involving an engine failure. The penalties for loss of an engine are twofold, performance and control. The most obvious problem is the loss of 50% of power, which reduces climb performance 80 to 90%, sometimes even more. The other is the control problem caused by the remaining thrust, which is now asymmetrical. Attention to both these factors is crucial to safe OEI flight. The performance and systems redundancy of a multi-engine airplane is a safety advantage only to a trained and proficient pilot. Terms and definitions. Pilots of single engine airplanes are already familiar with many performance V speeds and their definitions. Twin engine airplanes have several additional V speeds unique to OEI operation. These speeds are differentiated by the notation SE for single engine. A review of some of the key V speeds and Several new V-speeds unique to twin-engine airplanes follows. VR, rotation speed, the speed at which back pressure is applied to rotate the airplane to a takeoff attitude. VLOF, liftoff speed, the speed at which the airplane leaves the surface. Note, some manufacturers reference takeoff performance data to VR, others to VLOF. VX, Best angle of climb speed, the speed at which the airplane will gain the greatest altitude for a given distance of forward travel. VXSE, best angle of climb speed with one engine inoperative. VY, 
Best rate of climb speed. The speed at which the airplane will gain the most altitude for a given unit of time. VYSE. Best rate of climb speed with one engine inoperative. Marked with a blue radial line on most airspeed indicators. Above the single engine absolute ceiling, VYSE yields the minimum rate of sink. VSSE. Safe intentional one engine inoperative speed. Originally known as safe single engine speed, now formally defined in Title 14 of the Code of Federal Regulations, 14 CFR, Part 23, Airworthiness Standards, and required to be established and published in the AFM POH. It is the minimum speed to intentionally render the critical engine inoperative. VMC Minimum control speed with a critical engine inoperative. Marked with a red radial line on most airspeed indicators. The minimum speed at which directional control can be maintained under a very specific set of circumstances outlined in 14 CFR Part 23, Airworthiness Standards. Under the small airplane certification regulations currently in effect, the flight test pilot must be able to 1. Stop the turn that results when the critical engine is suddenly made inoperative within 20 degrees of the original heading, using maximum rudder deflection and a maximum of 5 degree bank. And 2. Thereafter, maintain straight flight with not more than a 5 degree bank. There is no requirement in this determination that the airplane be capable of climbing at this airspeed. VMC only addresses directional control. Further discussion of VMC, as determined during the airplane certification and demonstrated in pilot training, follows in minimum control airspeed. VMC demonstration. Figure 12-1. Unless otherwise noted, when V speeds are given in the AFM POH, they apply to sea level, standard day conditions at maximum takeoff weight. Performance speeds vary with aircraft weight, configuration, and atmospheric conditions. The speeds may be stated in statute miles per hour, MPH, or knots, KTS, and they may be given as calibrated airspeeds, CAS, or indicated airspeeds, IAS. As a general rule, the newer AFM POHs show V speeds in knots indicated airspeed, KIAS. Some V speeds are also stated in knots calibrated airspeed. KCAS to meet certain regulatory requirements. Whenever available, pilots should operate the airplane from the published indicated airspeeds. With regard to climb performance, the multi engine airplane, particularly in the takeoff or landing configuration, may be considered to be a single engine airplane with its power plant divided into two units. There is nothing in 14 CFR Part 23 that requires a multi-engine airplane to maintain altitude when in takeoff or landing configuration with one engine inoperative. In fact, many twins are not required to do this in any configuration, even at sea level. The current 14 CFR Part 23 Single Engine Climb Performance Requirements for Reciprocating Engine Powered Multi-Engine Airplanes are as follows. More than 6,000 pounds maximum weight and or VSO more than 61 knots, the single engine rate of climb in feet per minute FPM at 5,000 feet MSL must be equal to or at least 0 0.027 VSO squared. For airplanes type certificated February 4, 1991 or thereafter, the climb requirement is expressed in terms of a climb gradient. 1.5%. The climb gradient is not a direct equivalent of the 0.027 VSO squared formula. Do not confuse the date of type certification with the airplane's model year. The type certification basis of many multi-engine airplanes dates back to CAR3, the Civil Aviation Regulations, forerunner of today's Code of Federal Regulations. 6,000 pounds or less maximum weight and VSO 61 knots or less, the single engine rate of climb at 5,000 MSL must simply be determined. 
the rate of climb could be a negative number. There is no requirement for a single engine positive rate of climb at 5,000 feet or any other altitude. For light twins, type certificated February 4th, 1991 or thereafter, the single engine climb gradient, positive or negative, is simply determined. Rate of climb is the altitude gain per unit of time, while climb gradient is the actual measure of altitude gained per 100 feet of horizontal travel, expressed as a percentage. An altitude gain of 1.5 feet per 100 feet of travel, or 15 feet per 1,000 feet, or 150 feet per 10,000, is a climb gradient of 1.5%. There is a dramatic performance loss associated with the loss of an engine, particularly just after takeoff. Any airplane's climb performance is a function of thrust horsepower, which is in excess of that required for level flight. In a hypothetical twin with each engine producing 200 thrust horsepower, assume that the total level flight thrust horsepower required is 175. In this situation, the airplane would ordinarily have a reserve of 225 thrust horsepower available for climb. Loss of one engine would only leave 25, 200 minus 175, thrust horsepower available for climb, a drastic reduction. Sea level rate of climb performance losses of at least 80 to 90 percent, even under ideal circumstances, are typical for multi engine airplanes in OEI flight. Operation of Systems This section will deal with the systems that are generally found on multi-engine airplanes. Multi-engine airplanes share many features with complex single-engine airplanes. There are certain systems and features covered here, however, that are generally unique to airplanes with two or more engines. Propellers The propellers of the multi-engine airplane may outwardly appear to be identical in operation to constant speed propellers of many single-engine airplanes, but this is not the case. The propellers of multi-engine airplanes are featherable to minimize the drag in the event of an engine failure. Depending upon single-engine performance, this feature often permits continued flight to a suitable airport following an engine failure. To feather a propeller is to stop engine rotation with the propeller blades streamlined with the airplane's relative wind, thus to minimize drag. See figure 12-2. Feathering is necessary because of the change in parasite drag with propeller blade angle. Figure 12-3. When the propeller blade angle is in the feathered position, the change in parasite drag is at a minimum, and in the case of a typical multi-engine airplane, the added parasite drag from a single feathered propeller is a relatively small contributor to the airplane total drag. At the smaller blade angles near the flat pitch position, the drag added by the propeller is very large. At these small blade angles, the propeller windmilling at high RPM can create such a tremendous amount of drag that the airplane may be uncontrollable. The propeller windmilling at high speed in the low range of blade angles can produce an increase in parasite drag, which may be as great as the parasite drag of the basic airplane. As a review, the constant speed propellers on almost all single engine airplanes are of the non feathering, oil pressure to increase pitch design. In this design, increased oil pressure from the propeller governor drives the blade angle towards high pitch, low RPM. In contrast, the constant speed propellers installed on most multi-engine airplanes are full feathering, counterweighted, oil pressure to decrease pitch designs. In this design, increased oil pressure from the propeller governor drives the blade angle towards low pitch, high RPM, away from the feather blade angle. In effect, the only thing that keeps these propellers from feathering is a constant supply of high pressure engine oil. This is a necessity to enable propeller feathering in the event of a loss of oil pressure or a propeller governor failure. The aerodynamic forces alone acting upon a windmilling propeller tend to drive the blades to low pitch, high RPM. Counterweights attached to the shank of each blade tend to drive the blades to high pitch, low RPM. 
inertia, or apparent force called centrifugal force acting through the counterweights is generally slightly greater than the aerodynamic forces. Oil pressure from the propeller governor is used to counteract the counterweights and drives the blade angles to low pitch, high RPM. A reduction in oil pressure causes the RPM to be reduced from the influence of the counterweights. Figure 12-4 To feather the propeller, the propeller control is brought fully aft. All oil pressure is dumped from the governor, and the counterweights drive the propeller blades towards feather. As centrifugal force acting on the counterweights decays from decreasing RPM, additional forces are needed to completely feather the blades. This additional force comes from either a spring or high-pressure air stored in the propeller dome, which forces the blades into the feathered position. The entire process may take up to 10 seconds. Feathering a propeller only alters blade angle and stops engine rotation. To completely secure the engine, the pilot must still turn off the fuel, mixture, electric boost pump, and fuel selector, ignition, alternator slash generator, and close the cowl flaps. If the airplane is pressurized, there also may be an air bleed to close for the failed engine. Some airplanes are equipped with firewall shutoff valves that secure several of these systems with a single switch. Completely securing a failed engine may not be necessary or even desirable depending upon the failure mode, altitude, and time available. The position of the fuel controls, ignition, and alternator slash generator switches of the failed engine has no effect on aircraft performance. There is always the distinct possibility of manipulating the incorrect switch under conditions of haste or pressure. To unfeather a propeller, the engine must be rotated so that oil pressure can be generated to move the propeller blades from the feathered position. The ignition is turned on prior to engine rotation, with the throttle at low idle and the mixture rich. With the propeller control in a high RPM position, the starter is engaged. The engine will begin to windmill, start, and run as the oil pressure moves the blades out of feather. As the engine starts, the propeller RPM should be immediately reduced until the engine has had several minutes to warm up. The pilot should monitor cylinder head and oil temperatures. Should the RPM obtained with a starter be insufficient to unfeather the propeller, an increase in airspeed from a shallow dive will usually help. In any event, the AFM POH procedures should be followed for the exact unfeathering procedure. Both feathering and starting a feathered reciprocating engine on the ground are strongly discouraged by manufacturers due to the excessive stress and vibrations generated. As just described, a loss of oil pressure from the propeller governor allows the counterweights, spring, and or dome charge to drive the blades to feather. Logically then, the propeller blades should feather every time an engine is shut down as oil pressure falls to zero. Yet, this does not occur. Preventing this is a small pin in the pitch changing mechanism of the propeller hub that will not allow the propeller blades to feather once RPM drops below approximately 800. The pin senses the lack of centrifugal force from the propeller rotation and falls into place, preventing the blades from feathering. Therefore, if a propeller is to be feathered, it must be done before engine RPM decays below approximately 800. On one popular model of turboprop engine, the propeller blades do, in fact, feather with each shutdown. This propeller is not equipped with such centrifugally operated pins due to a unique engine design. An unfeathering accumulator is an optional device that permits starting a feathered engine in flight without the use of the electric starter. An accumulator is any device that stores a reserve of high pressure. On multi-engine airplanes, the unfeathering accumulator stores a small reserve of engine oil under pressure from compressed air or nitrogen. To start a feathered engine in flight, the pilot moves the propeller control out of the feather position to release the accumulator pressure. The oil flows under pressure to the propeller hub and drives the blades toward the high RPM, 
low pitch position, whereupon the propeller will usually begin to windmill. On some airplanes, an assist from the electric starter may be necessary to initiate rotation and completely unfeather the propeller. If fuel and ignition are present, the engine will start and run. For airplanes used in training, this saves much electric starter and battery wear. High oil pressure from the propeller governor recharges the accumulator just moments after engine rotation begins. Propeller Synchronization Many multi-engine airplanes have a propeller synchronizer, prop sync, installed to eliminate the annoying drumming or beat of propellers whose RPM are close but not precisely the same. To use prop sync, the propeller RPM are coarsely matched by the pilot and the system is engaged. The prop sync adjusts the RPM of the slave engine to precisely match the RPM of the master engine and then maintains the relationship. The prop sync should be disengaged when the pilot selects a new propeller RPM, then re-engaged after the new RPM is set. The prop sync should always be off for takeoff, landing, and single engine operation. The AFM POH should be consulted for system description and limitations. A variation of the propeller synchronizer is the propeller synchrophaser. Prop synchrophase acts much like a synchronizer to precisely match RPM, but the synchrophaser goes one step further. It not only matches RPM, but actually compares and adjusts the positions of the individual blades of the propellers in their arcs. There can be significant propeller noise and vibration reductions with a propeller synchrophaser. From the pilot's perspective, Operation of a propeller synchronizer and a propeller synchrophaser are very similar. A synchrophaser is also commonly referred to as prop sync, although it is not entirely correct nomenclature from a technical standpoint. As a pilot aid to manually synchronizing the propellers, some twins have a small gauge mounted in or by the tachometers with a propeller symbol on a disc that spins. The pilot manually fine tunes the engine RPM so as to stop disc rotation, thereby synchronizing the propellers. This is a useful backup to synchronizing engine RPM using the audible propeller beat. This gauge is also found installed with most propeller synchronizer and synchrophase systems. Some synchrophase systems use a knob for the pilot to control the phase angle. Fuel crossfeed. Fuel crossfeed systems are also unique to multi-engine airplanes. Using crossfeed, an engine can draw fuel from a fuel tank located in the opposite wing. In most multi-engine airplanes, operation in the crossfeed mode is an emergency procedure used to extend airplane range and endurance in OEI flight. There are a few models that permit crossfeed as a normal fuel balancing technique in normal operation but these are not common. The AFM POH will describe crossfeed limitations and procedures, which vary significantly among multi-engine airplanes. Checking crossfeed operation on the ground with a quick repositioning of the fuel selectors does nothing more than ensure freedom of motion of the handle. To actually check crossfeed operation, a complete functional crossfeed system check should be accomplished. To do this, each engine should be operated from its crossfeed position during the run-up. The engines should be checked individually and allowed to run at moderate power, 1500 RPM minimum, for at least one minute to ensure that fuel flow can be established from the crossfeed source. Upon completion of the check, each engine should be operated for at least one minute at moderate power from the main takeoff fuel tanks to reconfirm fuel flow prior to takeoff. This suggested check is not required prior to every flight. Infrequently used, however, crossfeed lines are ideal places for water and debris to accumulate unless they are used from time to time and drained using their external drains during pre-flight. Crossfeed is ordinarily not used for completing single-engine flights when an alternative airport is readily at hand and is never used during takeoff or landings. Combustion Heater 
Combustion heaters are common on multi-engine airplanes. A combustion heater is best described as a small furnace that burns gasoline to produce heated air for occupant comfort and windshield defogging. Most are thermostatically operated and have a separate hour meter to record time in service for maintenance purposes. Automatic over-temperature protection is provided by a thermal switch mounted on the unit, which cannot be accessed in flight. This requires the pilot or mechanic to actually visually inspect the unit for possible heat damage in order to reset the switch. When finished with the combustion heater, a cool-down period is required. Most heaters require that outside air be permitted to circulate through the unit for at least 15 seconds in flight, or that the ventilation fan be operated for at least 2 minutes on the ground. Failure to provide an adequate cool-down will usually trip the thermal switch and render the heater inoperative until the switch is reset. Flight Director slash Autopilot Flight Director slash Autopilot, FD slash AP systems are common on the better equipped multi-engine airplanes. The system integrates pitch, roll, heading, altitude, and radio navigation signals in a computer. The outputs, called computed commands, are displayed on a flight command indicator, or FCI. The FCI replaces the conventional attitude indicator on the instrument panel. The FCI is occasionally referred to as a flight director indicator, FDI, or as an attitude director indicator, ADI. The entire flight director slash autopilot system is sometimes called an Integrated Flight Control System, IFCS, by some manufacturers. Others may use the term Automatic Flight Control System, AFCS. The FD-AP system may be employed at three different levels, off, raw data, flight director, computed commands, autopilot. With the system off, the FCI operates as an ordinary attitude indicator. On most FCIs, the command bars are biased out of view when the flight director is off. The pilot maneuvers the airplane as though the system were not installed. To maneuver the airplane using the flight director, the pilot enters the desired modes of operation, heading, altitude, nav intercept, and tracking on the FD slash AP mode controller. The computed flight commands are then displayed to the pilot through either a single queue or dual queue system in the FCI. On a single queue system, the commands are indicated by V bars. On a dual queue system, the commands are displayed on two separate command bars, one for pitch and one for roll. To maneuver the airplane using computed commands, the pilot flies the symbolic airplane of the FCI to match the steering cues presented. On most systems, to engage the autopilot, the flight director must first be operating. At any time thereafter, the pilot may engage the autopilot through the mode controller. The autopilot then maneuvers the airplane to satisfy the computed commands of the flight director. Like any computer, the FDAP system will only do what it is told. The pilot must ensure that it has been properly programmed for the particular phase of flight desired. The armed and or engaged modes are usually displayed on the mode controller or separate annunciator lights. When the airplane is being hand-flown, if the flight director is not being used at any particular moment, it should be off so that the command bars are pulled from view. Prior to system engagement, all FD, AP, computer, and trim checks should be accomplished. Many newer systems cannot be engaged without the completion of a self-test. The pilot must also be very familiar with various methods of disengagement, both normal and emergency. System details, including approvals and limitations, can be found in the supplements section of the AFM POH. Additionally, many avionics manufacturers can provide informative pilot operating guides upon request. Yaw damper. The yaw damper is a servo that moves the rudder in response to input from a gyroscope or accelerometer that detects yaw rate. 
The yaw damper minimizes motion about the vertical axis caused by turbulence. Yaw dampers on swept-wing airplanes provide another, more vital function of dampening Dutch roll characteristics. Occupants will feel a smoother ride, particularly if seated in the rear of the airplane, when the yaw damper is engaged. The yaw damper should be off for takeoff and landing. There may be additional restrictions against its use during single-engine operation. Most yaw dampers can be engaged independently of the autopilot. Alternator slash generator. Alternator or generator paralleling circuitry matches the output of each engine's alternator slash generator so that the electrical system load is shared equally between them. In the event of an alternator slash generator failure, the inoperative unit can be isolated and the entire electrical system powered from the remaining one. Depending upon the electrical capacity of the alternator slash generator, the pilot may need to reduce the electrical load referred to as load shedding, when operating on a single unit. The AFM POH will contain system description and limitations. Nose baggage compartment. Nose baggage compartments are common on multi-engine airplanes and are even found in a few single-engine airplanes. There is nothing strange or exotic about a nose baggage compartment and the usual guidance concerning observation of load limit applies. They are mentioned here in that pilots occasionally neglect to secure the latches properly, and therein lies the danger. When improperly secured, the door will open and the contents may be drawn out, usually into the propeller arc, and usually just after takeoff. Even when the nose baggage compartment is empty, airplanes have been lost when the pilot became distracted by the open door. Security of the nose baggage compartment latches and locks is a vital pre-flight item. Most airplanes will continue to fly with the nose baggage door open. There may be some buffeting from the disturbed airflow, and there will be an increase in noise. Pilots should never become so preoccupied with an open door of any kind that they fail to fly the airplane. Inspection of the compartment interior is also an important pre-flight item. More than one pilot has been surprised to find a supposedly empty compartment packed to capacity or loaded with ballast. The tow bars, engine inlet covers, windshield sunscreens, oil containers, spare chocks, and miscellaneous small hand tools that find their way into baggage compartments should be secured to prevent damage from shifting in flight. Anti-icing, de-icing. Anti-icing slash de-icing equipment is frequently installed on multi-engine airplanes and consists of a combination of different systems. These may be classified as either anti-icing or de-icing, depending upon function. The presence of anti-icing and de-icing equipment, even though it may appear elaborate and complete, does not necessarily mean the airplane is approved for flight in icing conditions. The AFM, POH, placards, and even the manufacturer should be consulted for specific determination of approvals and limitations. Anti-icing equipment is provided to prevent ice from forming on certain protected surfaces. Anti-icing equipment includes heated pitot tubes, heated or non-icing static ports, and fuel vents, propeller blades with electrothermal boots or alcohol slingers, windshields with alcohol spray or electrical resistance heating, windshield defoggers, and heated stall warning lift detectors. On many turboprop engines, the lip surrounding the air intake is heated either electrically or with bleed air. In the absence of AFM POH guidance to the contrary, anti-icing equipment is actuated prior to flight into known or suspected icing conditions. De-icing equipment is generally limited to pneumatic boots on wing and tail leading edges. De-icing equipment is installed to remove ice that has already formed on protected surfaces. Upon pilot actuation, the boots inflate with air from the pneumatic pumps to break off accumulated ice. After a few seconds of inflation, they are deflated back to their normal position with the assistance of a vacuum. The pilot monitors the buildup of ice and cycles the boots as directed in the AFM-POH.
An ice light on the left engine nacelle allows the pilot to monitor wing ice accumulation at night. Other airframe equipment necessary for flight in icing conditions includes an alternate induction air source and an alternate static system source. Ice tolerant antennas will also be installed. In the event of impact ice accumulating over normal engine air induction sources, carburetor heat, carbureted engines, or alternate air, fuel injected engines, should be selected. Ice buildup on normal induction sources can be detected by a loss of engine RPM with fixed pitch propellers and a loss of manifold pressure with constant speed propellers. On some fuel-injected engines, an alternate air source is automatically activated with blockage of the normal air source. An alternate static system provides an alternate source of static air for the pitot static system in the unlikely event that the primary static source becomes blocked. In non-pressurized airplanes, most alternate static sources are plumbed to the cabin. On pressurized airplanes, they are usually plumbed to a non-pressurized baggage compartment. The pilot must activate the alternate static source by opening a valve or a fitting in the cockpit. Upon activation, the airspeed indicator, altimeter, and the vertical speed indicator, VSI, will be affected and will read somewhat in error. A correction table is frequently provided in the AFM POH. Anti-icing slash de-icing equipment only eliminates ice from the protected surfaces. Significant ice accumulations may form on unprotected areas, even with proper use of anti-ice and de-ice systems. Flight at high angles of attack or even normal climb speeds will permit significant ice accumulation on lower wing surfaces, which are unprotected. Many AFM POHs mandate minimum speeds to be maintained in icing conditions. Degradation of all flight characteristics and large performance losses can be expected with ice accumulations. Pilots should not rely on the stall warning devices for adequate stall warning with ice accumulations. Ice will accumulate unevenly on the airplane. It will add weight and drag, primarily drag, and decrease thrust and lift. Even wing shape affects ice accumulation. Thin airfoil sections are more prone to ice accumulation than thick, highly cambered sections. For this reason, certain surfaces, such as the horizontal stabilizer, are more prone to icing than the wing. With ice accumulations, landing approaches should be made with a minimum wing flap setting, flap extension increases the angle of attack of the horizontal stabilizer, and with an added margin of airspeed. Sudden and large configuration and airspeed changes should be avoided. Unless otherwise recommended in the AFM POH, the autopilot should not be used in icing conditions. Continuous use of the autopilot will mask trim and handling changes that will occur with ice accumulation. Without this control feedback, the pilot may not be aware of ice accumulation building to hazardous levels. The autopilot will suddenly disconnect when it reaches design limits and the pilot may find the airplane has assumed unsatisfactory handling characteristics. The installation of anti-ice slash de-ice equipment on airplanes without AFM POH approval for flight into icing conditions is to facilitate escape when such conditions are inadvertently encountered. Even with AFM POH approval, the prudent pilot will avoid icing conditions to the maximum extent practicable and avoid extended flight in any icing conditions. No multi-engine airplane is approved for flight into severe icing conditions, and none are intended for indefinite flight in continuous icing conditions. End of Part 1 of Chapter 12